Hi, I'm Dr. Lusheen. Uh, typically what I do is I do a weekly reflection video or review video for all my classes, but um, it's been really busy this month of November. Um, and so what I decided to do is do a combined video for both my 43, 683 class and my 783 class. Um, this, the, the 43, 683 has some graduate students in it that are in 783, um, vice versa. And so I thought it'd be good to kind of just cover both at the same time. So I've got a few things I want to talk about. First, I want to talk a little bit about reflective thinking. Um, I, I hope that you're all, you know, considering using a, your own journal in what you're learning in order to, you know, better c connect the, uh, the lessons, um, provide a, a deeper understanding of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about course metrics because that's something I do and then kind of cover some things that are similar between the classes and then go off on a story. So what's interesting between the two is that um, for my 43683 class, it's very much about the, the foundations and techniques you can use early in your career in order to get management support or get them committed to the safety program and at the same time engaging the workers and using data to um, drive your decision making and to show value in what you're recommending to management. Uh, similarly, but a little bit different, is the 783 class what I'm doing is trying to provide the students with the foundational research that goes into um, practicing uh, Safety in a way in which you can understand things in a different way um, that you'll that you'll measure things and use actual research, be objective in your approach, and make decisions that will um, benefit the workers and and the safety program, and not just focusing on one or the other. <clears throat> so they're related. For my um, 43683 class, here's the last four weeks of performance. This is important because I am very data-driven in the work I do, and a person's commitment to the class, their um, stated or Im assumed uh, commitment to their own learning tends to come out in weekly performance. And so I track time and views. And here what I've done is I've given it class-wide and then separated it undergrad to grad. You'll see across the board, the graduate students put in more time. They're looking at more items on the, the course website um, and their, their grade and their performance matches that. You know, they have a uh, almost an inert desire to learn. Uh, they have the ability to immediately understand how it applies to their practice, you know, or their craft. Um, and this is in addition to probably working full-time jobs, having families, all that other stuff. The undergrads, on the other hand, are, aren't there yet. Um, some of them are. We've, we've got some very high-performing undergrads in this class. But uh, for the most part, we do have some that have completely fallen off. They don't really look at things as much. They're not turning in assignments. and They've completely quit on the project, which is unfortunate. But I, like I had said in that class earlier, it happens every semester. Here is my 783 performance. I didn't do week one. Week one was still a little bit shaky. I had some students that were still coming on, some leaving. So uh, the two and three performance is a little bit more robust. Um, it's It hasn't changed a lot. There was more time in week two than week three. There were higher views as well. Um, Right, and but the performance, yeah, the performance is pretty much staying on par. Um, there are students that are definitely separating themselves. Um, and the one other thing I'll say is, as a professor, um, I try, you know, the ones who are there to learn and are demonstrating it to me, go. I, I, I want you to challenge me to show you more. Those that aren't doing the work, I'm going to scrutinize what you submit because obviously you're in a um, in a position to be more likely to just try to turn something in or to try to, you know, not put in as much work as you should to get something done or to, there's, there's a higher propensity uh, for plagiarism um, with those types of students. And as I'm talking, as I'm talking about this, also you can see on here, I've been separating the students in this class of 783 into teams one, two, and three. You guys have self-selected yourselves into those teams based on how early in the week you engaged in discussion um, and your overall, um, 
use of the discussion board throughout the week. And as you can see, the scores clearly indicate that these people that I've placed on team one are performing much higher, putting in more time, looking at more things and scoring higher. It's even more evident in week three. So if you're waiting until Sunday to do all the work, you're not engaging, you're not getting as much out of it. So as I've covered all of this, I want you to think about this from the workplace perspective, that when you get into the workplace, and you want people to be successful and safe and elicit satisfaction, you're going to have a group that they can do it on their own. And they're likely to actually help out people around them. Secondly, you're going to have a group that needs a little bit of push, needs a little bit of monitoring, needs a little bit of, you know, a little bit extra to try and get to that. They're not, they're probably not going to get to that super high performance. Some will, some will lag. And then we've got the group that is going to take almost all of our time and effort and resource to try to get them there, get them to the point. I have that too in the classroom. And this helps me identify who they are real early in the semester, and then I can focus on that. So what are some similarities between my classes? Um, and this is slides from both classes. First is this organizational model of safety improvement. I teach it in both classes. The idea being that um, if left, to, left on its own, the safety program will tend to be aligned with what management sees, sees and thinks which is not really what's going on. It's within their perspective, through their lens, and that will set up the rules and policies, tends to not be put in the same language or perspective as what workers and supervisors need, so they've got to figure it out on their own, and depending on what the outcomes are, they're going to get blamed for it. Typically, that's the default. So what we need to do as safety professionals is try to understand what the workers and supervisors are deeming or perceiving needs to be done, um, attempt to understand their perspective and their expectations and how it lends to how they do their job and then go educate management with actual data on what needs to be done to improve things and how what their role, what their messaging is. Over here, I've got the work system model. For the 783 class, you actually get to read the foundational work that went into the design of this model. It was the Smith and Carrion paper from 1989. And then um, my old mentor, my former mentor, um, Dr. Karsh, he's the one who kind of, for the first time, reorganized it this way. And I added the outcomes um, as a way that what we need to do is get down to the root cause. If we eliminate that, we'll eliminate future occurrences, but also the importance of collecting and analyzing those incidents that don't result in anything, any harm. Um, I'll, the other thing I teach, at least in my earlier class, and I think I do talk about 783, is using a quality management approach. And I did a lot of research and published some papers on this when I was in graduate school, that things should be data-driven. Um, and by collecting data and understanding it and making iterative improvements in the work system, I'm sorry, maybe just in the safety program, we should be able to monitor how that has affected the outcomes. So it's like my, my demonstration of yesterday, today, tomorrow safety, that it's data driven. We're tracking it. If it's not improving, we've got to go back and change something else. But we should get consistent improvement then, a measurable improvement if we're doing it that way, if we're taking a quality management approach. And of course, there are all kinds of tools in the toolkit that we can use to try to get down to the root cause. That is, what went wrong? Why did it go wrong? But ultimately, the controls need to be able to limit exposure to those things that are causing harm. So I spoke just previously on the yesterday, today, tomorrow approach to things, and it's meant to be a representation of what continuous improvement is, which is what quality management is. And then I kind of backtrack to the idea is how are we perceiving, <coughs> analyzing, documenting, when a worker does get injured or when they report a concern. And the way we collect can affect how workers perceive safety and management commitment and us. Um, we want to try and limit the, um, the chance that they would perceive that we're being, that we, we're blaming them. We want to include them. We want this to be a learning process, not a find fault process. Um, and the data we collect is very important. If we're not collecting and taking a balanced, unbiased approach, the data we collect is, is going to be limited in its ability to diagnose where we should be focusing in the future. You all know that I love data and I love Heinrich and Bird. And what I did is I took their pyramids and I pushed them over 
and turned it into distributions. And what that showed is that we, when you, somebody reports like the average cost of something or the average number of days off for a particular cause, it's not accurate because it's not a normal curve, it's asymptotic. And over here, I've got a demonstration, a comparison of two distributions I have um, for some of the class projects I've done in 43, 683, and it's still, everything always represents an asymptotic um, uh, model. So therefore, we have to look beyond it. All right, so we've gotten to the story time, um, and this came out of my Sunday morning office hour with my 683 students. Um, but it relates to things we talk about in 783. And that is through grad school. Throughout graduate school, I worked at the uh, Department of Health and Family Services at One West Wilson. And I was kind of in charge of the long-term care facilities uh, throughout Wisconsin. There were seven of them. And um, it was through that experience and taking classes and learning statistics and research methods that I got to experiment. And my boss she was amazing, hands down. I was trying to find a picture of her, but I couldn't find one. So what I have pictures of is, this is my daughter, my oldest daughter. Um, she was there. This is where I wrote my um, dissertation, right here at this desk uh, at home. I actually had torn apart an old computer tower and added memory to it so I could use it. This is earlier 2000s, everybody. Um, this picture here is me with my daughter and my youngest brother. We're at uh, Memorial Terrace on Lake uh, Men Mendota, yeah, on campus. This was the day I defended. So in effect, this was the first day, the first hour or two in which I was, you know, a doctor. So that was pretty awesome. I still had to finish writing and do editing and submit, but this is when I was approved. So all my mentors signed off on it. Greatest, one of the greatest days of my life. That is, it's such a load off. Um, and here's me graduating a few months later. So what is this, where does this all go to? Well, um, early on in my time, I asked, could I review all of the um, OSHA recordable data for, for the whole building and for all the facilities? So I took it upon myself to understand it. And as I started reading it, I found that everything they had pre-2002 pre was garbage. It wasn't any good. It was all paper. So I started teaching myself how to enter and sort and analyze things in Microsoft Excel. And that's, that was the beginning of it. And I, I got really intimate with the data um, and trying to understanding how it trended, where it came from, some other information, found out that the information we were collecting could be improved. And so I created a new reporting system, a new an, uh, incident analysis system, and I trained people on how to do it. And eventually what it allowed me to do is to prioritize where we need to spend our time and what is causing um, the either, both the most frequent and the most severe outcomes. And I've got a bunch of the stuff over here. And back then I even started using the risk priority numbers and the um, Pareto ratio. So I was doing quarterly and annual. And then, you know, over time, trending over years, I started getting it, a breakdown of all seven of my facilities and looking at the hours that went into incidence rates and what it meant. This, this basically got the attention of management, of upper management. They understood that the numbers were giving us priorities and what the numbers in comparison to each other meant in dollars because they related to the comp dollars. And that led to further analysis where I started, <laughs> I had a distribution here. It was one of my first ones, first uh, uh, asymptotic. Um, I did it by the types of injuries. In, I was kind of narrowing the scope of what's going on. And here I even did uh, cases with days away and how much days away. And again, I'm seeing these similar trends that I had indicated before. This is the beginning of my career. In um, 43683, we do a project, our module two project is a write-up. And so I created this data set based on my experiences and some, it's it's modified slightly to things I had used before. And we started doing trends and analyzing ratios and doing risk priority numbers to figure out what to focus on. Ultimately coming up with, you know, focusing on a job title and a cause. Though that could be a class code, that could be a department and a cause, estimating future losses. And by doing that, we have the basis of which we should, we can ask for investment or go to them asking for investment for what a solution we found through an in-depth study and we're in engaging the workers. So let's go, I want to quickly go over, I know this is a little bit long, but I think you guys will find this interesting. 
uh, the Lost One Data Project we're using for this semester. So it's something that I've integrated into my 43683 course. There's not time to do it in 783, but next fall, if any of you are like, hey, this sounds interesting, you can take it next fall. It's online. It's a pro it's my technique. And also what's interesting is um, I'm going to be writing a book, a textbook. This should be ready my next fall to help combine all the concepts I talked about here and demonstrate how to do this analysis technique. So for those of you who are not aware of it, I get a new loss run data set. I, 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 there, it's, it's secret who gets me these things, but um, they all, they're, a unique, they're all unique in their own way. And so they all have to be analyzed in a particular way. And I kind of let it tell its story, which you can see here again, we've had a few grads, undergrads completely quit. Um, it's too bad because it's threefold. You get to learn what is work comp and claims. Two, you get to learn about the, the law and where everything comes from. And three, you get to learn Excel. So it's all good. So we evaluate the quality of the data. You should always do that. You analyze any data set. You need to know what its you know basic scope is. Uh, evaluate the performance of the safety program based on historical data. Identify priorities and then come up with the forecasted loss. And then a request an investment based on ROI or return on investment. So that's that. So let's take a look and see what we found um this semester so here's what we were given uh a little bit about the company the uh company we're analyzing is nursing care facilities and this is going to extend on a story that i had when i was doing my work at the state and actually led to my eventual dissertation um the account premium is about 2.9 million their mod for 2022 is 1.22 now what does that mean the 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 base premium is generated by the Wisconsin Credit Rating Bureau or this WCRB. And it is a sum of all the class code rates multiplied by their individual payrolls divided by 100. You multiply that out, you add it all up, that's the base premium. That base premium I estimated to be about 2.38 million. And that comes to about, I read around 1,200 employees approximately. And if we assume a 60% risk ratio, which is what most companies do, that means there's an expected loss per year, at least a three-year rolling average going into this of about 1.4 million. So if a company can go three years lower than the expected and, and get lower than that 60% risk ratio, they have the ability to have a lower EMR, an EMR below one, and actually pay less what their base premium is. So in this case, it's at 2.9 million. Based on the estimates from this analysis, this is gonna go down naturally because our 19, 20, and 21 numbers look to be well below the 1.4 million, but there's always room for improvement. There's always the place you can find where we should be focusing our attention and for those who don't know, this is the experience modification formula that's used in Wisconsin. Um, it's very similar to the equation that's put out by the NCCI, the National uh, Compensation Something Something Bureau, or maybe it's not even a bureau or Inc. But this is basically it. Actual over expected is the basis for it. Here's the master data. We never mess with the master data. We leave that pristine. It's one of my rules. Here's the first result. So here's our descriptives. Um, we, we know the percent and breakdown of open and closed claims because an open claim will continue to collect till it's closed and it's, it's, it's finished, it's closed. So the more open claims you have in a particular year, the more green that year is and therefore it shouldn't be used in trending because it's going to go up considerably. They actually have a, um, a claim type, incident, medical and indemnity. Incident tends to be $0 claims. Medical medical only, and then indemnity, they receive some sort of wage benefit or other um, permanent partial payment in order to close the claim. Over here, I've got my paid amounts and my total paid. So in this particular data set, 2.45 million. And that runs from, uh, it runs from June 7th, 2019 to August 29th, 2022. I always create fiscal years in order to capture as much data as possible. And we were able to come up with three fiscal years. The fourth fiscal year is about two months worth. And it's so it's unusable from a trending perspective, but we can still look at it from a frequency perspective. What's another thing that's interesting here is look at our average per claim is about three, Point three thousand nine hundred, but the median is under three hundred dollars. 
So what does that mean? That means we've got a skewed data set. And so that's what we're going to look at next. Also, if you take out the $0 claims, it jumps up to five, uh, 5,600 know, approximately. And our most expensive claim represents about 8.7% of the, the max or the, the overall. So that's a lot of influence if you're using a risk priority number. Let's look quick at our distribution. As you can see here, um, this is similar to what I showed you before. It's asymptotic. It doesn't include the $0 claims. I take those out. But the median is below, and it, this is the this is claim amount um, by five hundred dollars. This is account uh, medians here, averages here. I've got eleven claims great. I have eleven claims greater than fifty thousand dollars, so that's one point seven six percent of the total claims. But it is about forty nine point seven percent of all the payments or all the benefits that had been paid. So very skewed. I've got my outliers. So I graphed all of them from high to low. So before it was the number of claims per $500, um, that's a distribution. This is all the claims high to low. What I do is I, nat I look for natural breaks because a, a smooth representation wouldn't have big extensive, um, what we call those extreme claims and that's what an outlier is, it's extreme. It's beyond, it's well beyond what the average and median might be. And so I look for a visual cutoff I just remove those claims and, and it happened to be in this semester, we took out 19 outliers. So pre outlier removal, see how smooth that is now? It's pretty good. 4.5 million start with, now it's down to 920,000. So took out 62% of, or 62.5% of the claims in the outliers. And then what we can do is we can look at these extreme cases. Um, you know, where did they occur? Um, what caused them and then we can actually read the descriptions and what i found from the description is most of them almost all of them had to do with interaction with the patient or the resident um and that's what led to or put the worker in a position to um, be injured and a lot of them are sprains and strains some some are slip trip and fall it varies um then we started doing the trending how's the safety program performing and so the question of what's the quality of the data, you don't say good or bad. What you do is you report what's there. Just it's an honest reporting versus a dishonest, oh, here's the average, here's the total. That doesn't tell me anything. I actually showed you how it looked when it's in a distribution or when it's high to low and identified outliers and what those outliers were. So it looks like over time, and I extended to 2023, because it's 2022 this year, um, and it looks like claims are going up and I actually use an R-square value. Now there's only three points, so the R-square isn't a robust representation, but anything above like a 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that's yeah, a pretty good fit. And then I also put in the um, line equations in order to use slope as a, an increase or decrease per year. If we look at the benefits paid, this is the total paid, it looks like overall the total paid is going down until 2023, but we can also look up here and see that about 7.8% of the claims in 2021 are still open. So this dot is going to go up, which means the slope is going to uh, decrease in its negative capacity. And the medical here seems to be almost level, so that has a chance to go up. The average claim, I don't even look at that anymore because it's so affected by these two that it becomes kind of ambiguous. Um, I did the trend with outliers removed. And what's interesting is now medical is going down. Now the numbers are a lot lower, but what you'll see is that my R squares are stronger. And that is a positive thing when you're doing analysis. It's, it's more representative of what's going on, but still it's going down. But again, the claims are going up. What's the deal? So then I started breaking the data down by its variables, the claim variables. First one is class code. And so what I do is I do the count, percent count, I get the total paid, percent total paid, and I get a risk priority number by multiplying the two together because risk is probability times severity. In this case, I did a proxy. Percent count is the frequency, percent total paid is my severity. And I get a risk priority number, which by magnitude provides a rank ordering of things. So I have one and two, and then I run a Pareto ratio to find out if 20% represents 80%. And that's what I got. I do this both with and without my outliers just to see how it might change. It didn't change. Though, um, the, from a magnitude perspective, 9040 became a kind of a greater amount. So we lost more of the 8833s because those were in the outliers. 
I did it for location. I didn't get as good a result as I liked. Did it for jurisdiction all. Didn't get as good as I liked. So what that tells me is I'm going to do, I'm going to focus my effort to trend and forecast losses using my class code. I also did cause and cause all. I did cause all with and without outliers. I did detail cause, didn't like it as much. It had issues, too many entries. I then, I tried my location, didn't like it, didn't think I would. I did jurisdiction, didn't like it, and I didn't think I would. But I still looked into it to demonstrate to my students on video why you know i initially thought it wouldn't be good because of my pareto analysis and then i showed them why got some answers but they're they're not good answers on where to focus and just at least see i color code them you know this this is hours and hours of work so i've got my 8833 this is all and so what i'm doing is now i'm now narrowing it to one class code and from there i'm going to narrow it to just individual causes within the claim data set and I do both annual averages, so I got three year fiscal year averages, and I've got the uh, scatter plot with a forecasted loss to 2023. And then I create one final results table per tab, and then I'm gonna be using that as a basis for my final results. So I did that for 8833, I did it for combative, slip, trip, and fall, and resident patient handling, and for my 9040 class code, I did it for resident handling, strip, trip, and fall, manual material handling. So the tables that we created earlier indicated what we should be focusing on. Um, I did some analysis on my data versus data from the Department of Workforce Development. And whether you looked at just indemnified claims or all claims, it just kind of showed how we compared to them. I thought it was interesting. But ultimately, what I'm working toward through all this work, and this, I mean, the students can tell you, they may have put in anywhere from four to eight to 10 hours per week working on this through um, four weeks. Fifth week isn't as difficult. So I've got my, um, I've got my six priorities here. I've got three from each class code. Here are the causes. Here is what the table, the annual averages gave me with and without outliers. And this is the outliers removed. And what's interesting is I went back and brought in my company wide data and then found out what my priorities represented and that's really interesting that all the work all the approach all the assumptions led to focusing on these six now let's go back to some of the original lessons here and that is i think we need to make a take a systems approach don't blame the worker but try to understand what in the work system allowed these workers to get injured and it's the proximity to discrepancies in the work system that result in injuries, that the worker was not aware enough or had the ability to react to prevent themselves from getting hurt. And so if, if we do nothing, if we change nothing in the work environment, and I'm not saying about, you know, if we blame workers and just retrain, that's not going to do anything. If we do nothing to in analyze, study, and change the work system, these are going to continue in the trend they're in. That's what this is telling us. That's what that's that's the basis for it. Quality management says let's measure it, forecast it. And now if we can actually go in and make functional changes, and those changes are based on study and engaging the workers on understanding how it's going to allow them to get their done work done uh, successfully, safely, and hopefully elicit some satisfaction from it, that the exposures will be functionally reduced. They will understand that we care for them. Management will show support so they'll tell us more and we will then reduce those exposures therefore reducing the claim numbers and reducing the severity of them too and it's those savings in dollars from a claim perspective that should get management excited and get them to invest in something that in the future will give them a greater return that's the whole purpose of this. That's what I learned when I was in grad school working at these facilities. I showed you the stuff in the PowerPoint. My analysis showed that there was a facility that needed attention. So we went in and studied it and found that um, one reason one of, the, one of the sections or whatever had such a high number of injuries was because, um, one, they were understaffed. Two, a lot of the worker um, caring or transitioning, needed they needed two people. 
And that second person was supposed to be the floor supervisor. However, the facility had the floor supervisors doing all kinds of paperwork. And they, what they estimated is 45 to 50 minutes out of each hour of their shift was spent report writing. So they were missing breaks. They weren't taking lunch. They're working late just to do the reporting that um, the facility wanted them to do. So I asked them, what percent of this reporting is pretty much redundant? You know, it's the same thing. They said, a lot of it. So I worked with them and I started creating reporting sheets that had checks. You know, they had a preset response to things. So they could just check, check, check instead of having to write all the things out. And they went from 45, 50 minutes per hour of their shift, you know, throughout the shift, down to like 10 to 15. So that increased their, you know, for each hour they're on shift, 30 more minutes they can be out roaming the floor, assisting others. That helped a lot. Number two is that there was this impression, and everybody sensed it, so um, that there was everything was very time related. That got to get these people up, got to get them um, to the bathroom, got to get them cleaned up, got to get them dressed, got to get them to the cafeteria, then got to get them on their activity bus so they can get off for their programming. And I said, well, that's ca- that's putting that's putting the workers stressed, and that is putting the patients and residents stress and some of them can't communicate and how they respond is through violence, not on purpose, not, they're not meaning to hurt. That's how they, that's all they know. And so what we did is uh, we changed the schedule that no, they, they don't have to be, get everybody up and down there in this short period of time. It's going to be as much time as it takes so that the people feel cared for and they're not, they're not rushed. And maybe some, you know, need to sleep a little bit longer or need a little bit more alone time on the commode, whatever it is. Um, And allow for two people to help when two people are needed. And then get down to the cafeteria. Take your time. Don't force them to, you know, eat their fruity pebbles in two minutes. Let them enjoy it, you know. And then whenever they get to the activity bus, the activity bus brings them to their programming. And maybe there's a there's an hour less of programming per day because of that. But I think it'll be worth it because the workers aren't rushing and getting things done. And those two changes, they're not safety related. I redesigned the work system. And that brought things down, uh, I want to say, anywhere from 65 to 75%. There were still issues and we came back and did other things, but it was that success that allowed us to go to other facilities and eventually allowed them to support my dissertation in which I did a comprehensive um, safety climate study in all the facilities and found some interesting insights that 783 we talk about a lot, 683 we talk about a little, but that's my story. It worked and that's why I, I talk so much about not blaming the worker and looking beyond it and that the data you know it's it's not only quality management based it's um it helps convince management on what to do and they understand it and so we we got support we had never gotten before um we got investment we had never gotten before and it was it was you know interacting with the workers and understanding the work from their perspective educating supervisors and managers on what that meant and getting upper management support that although I only started integrating the work comp data into my OSHA log analyses in like the last year or two of my time in grad school, um, you know, my in- initial estimates were about a half a million dollars per year savings in those two years. So a million total. There was still a big chunk there. But um, just in the work we did, um, it was impressive. It was really impressive. And it wasn't until after I got my first teaching job up at UMD that I contacted my old boss. And I'm like, hey, I want to teach this stuff that we did worked on together, but I can't find any textbooks or anything, anybody who talks about it. She goes, I know. <laughs> she goes, I just let you go. And you came up with all this stuff. And we benefited from it. So by all means, here, take your stuff with you. And so she let me you know, continue. And then I, I found friends who could give me other real data sets that we can analyze and I can teach what these concepts are by analyzing data. And I hope that's what you see. So back to the show. Um, Now what I'm showing is the estimated losses and the trends per year 
both with and without outliers. And this is this is using the scatter plots. And then I did the company wide stuff and what it represented from percentage. Again, I'm really impressed with how much um, was represented just in these six priority areas. And it's not just six out of whatever. I mean, it's a small <laughs> cross section of a much larger of what's been going on at this company. It's all historical. And let's get to the, the final ask. This is what we're working toward. And by the way, I rebuilt this this semester for those of you who are like, whoa, this is cool. I'm constantly improving it. It's on a continuous improvement loop just like everything else. This is what we came up with. So I, I, these are very conservative estimates. Very conservative. Um, either based on the outliers removed annual average or the outliers removed trend. And I use a 25% return on that investment as a basis. It can go up and down, but for my course, I use 25%. So, so you invest 100,000, but in a year, you're gonna get back 125. That's basically what that means. Um, forecast loss is about 173. The request investment is about 140 based on the 25%. And because these numbers are so low, because I always estimate low, we don't have to be 100, you know, 100% or batting 100 in order to achieve this, this return. Um, <laughs> And also by understanding it in these areas that are the the priorities, you know, the hotbeds of where the stuff's been occurring, we should be able to roll this out to other class codes and other applications, and we should be able to achieve much greater savings than what is estimated here. Because again, these are low estimates. So I've got, you know, I build in room for improvement, basically. Um, so again, we don't have to be 100%. So that is the project. So this is these are the results from this semester. And these are, although the presentation, I really like it. It's different. And I, I, I came up with all this while I had COVID. So <laughs> I got to double check it. But I think this is very um, um, fair. I think it's very fair. Um, I think it's very comprehensive and unbiased. And I think management will be able to relate to it, just like I had experience when I was in grad school. And I think it's going to help them understand that um, we were looking out for their investment, that it's going to make them look better, and we're engaging workers so we understand it from their perspective. Um, and I just think you're going to be successful if you take this approach. And this is something you replicate, you know, over a period of time. When I was working at the state, there was so much. We were doing it on a quarterly basis, extending it to biannual, and by the end, it was just annual. Um, but this goes much further than any um, insurance company may go or what a program that analyzes stuff will go. Um, we, we're gentle with it. We allow the data to tell its story versus you know be, beating it into submission, which is what some um, analytic approaches do. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you all enjoy this and I hope you all enjoy your Thanksgiving holiday. This is a great time to really reflect um, set short and long-term goals, kind of reset things because things get hectic over the holidays. So this is kind of the calm before the storm and I hope you all take advantage. And I do hope that with my 783 class that we can start meeting on a weekly basis because I've been meeting bi-weekly with my 43683 for office hours to help them out. But they're on the final phase. They're getting across the finish line right now with this project. And so here's what I want the project to kind of look like everybody. So wish you and your families a healthy and safe holiday. Um, Holla at me if you have any questions. <laughs>